Uh, similar to last week, uh, we, uh, we are again dealing with uh, a myth, something that we consider as, um, a, as a myth, uh, which says, you know, economic liberalization brings about political liberalization, which means that the more you accept um, free market um, and free trade and uh, you do privatization, you open your economies to the forces of um, the so-called free market and capitalism, the more you become new liberalistic or the more you become capitalistic, the more you will be able to promote um, political openness and, and democracy would flourish um, as the result of your economic liberalization. We have become familiar with this concept of econ- economic liberalization or neoliberalism in, uh, in, through the previous uh, sessions. I don't need to repeat that again, but what, what would this myth mean? It means the future of democracy will be very much dependent on the future of capitalism. I mean, the, the, if capitalism is uh, expanding together with the capitalist relations expanding across the world, uh, we will have democracy and liberal, especially liberal democracy and democratic values. Uh, expanding, it's um, it's possibly not too difficult to debunk this myth. You can just simply refer to so many non-democratic societies that have already adopted new liberal policies for two, three decades um, so far. And uh, when you look at their record of um, um, demo- de- their democratic records their record of the adoption of democratic values in their uh, politics, uh, they're still performing very poor and they have remained as autocratic as they used to. And not only that, not only in non-democratic societies, the uh, forces of free market have not brought uh, much of democracy, but also in the heartlands, the the birthplaces of um, of democracy um, and capitalism, uh, we'll see a kind of um, a demise, a decline uh, that we will get, um, uh, we will discuss that later by referring to a number of facts. And again, you really don't need to investigate um, and dig into so many numbers and you just look at the results of uh, elections, look at the results of Brexit, you can look at um, Um, elections that give um, rise to people like Donald Trump. And it's not just that person. Populism has been growing um, and rising uh, in many advanced societies. And, um, well, so the rise of populism in the heartlands of democracy and the uh, persistence of autocracy in um, non-democratic um, societies, the so-called third world societies or the global south, they all indicate there seems to be something wrong with this, um, uh, with this ideology that assumes there is a kind of a love story between capitalism and democracy. Wherever you've got capitalism, you've got democracy. Wherever dem- you have democracy, people vote for capitalism as the best option. What we want to actually uh, discuss today is, as, as, as a kind of an answer to this myth, is um, that capitalism is, um, um, in, in its nature, is in contradiction with what we call real democracy. Um, real democracy, I, I'll get back to this because, you know, what, what I call real democracy is a little bit different to uh, what we experience under the title of, um, of, um, of liberal democracy or parliamentary democracy or electoral democracy. So why is that? And um, again, if I just want to jump to the conclusion, so you would keep my conclusion in mind, so you will see how I'm trying to make the case through my slides, is that because capitalism makes politics kind of a secondary thing or democracy, a secondary um, objective or subordinate um, or a subservient to the economy. 
And um, this is very well embedded in the nature of capitalism and that, therefore it makes it uh, difficult uh, to conclude that capitalism has kind of love story with democracy. And so uh, we said we not only try to debunk um, the myths but uh, by, by, by referring to facts, but also by raising some ideas as, as alternative ideas. You know, the, and the alternative idea here to the myth is that democracy must be extended or can be extended into the very heart of economic sphere. And the fact that we have been limiting democracy to only the realm of uh, politics has been very much problematic uh, because the, the realm of um, economy is where a lot of uh, very, very super important decisions are made about um, the livelihoods of the people. And um, so how come democracy is something good that should be applied to uh, the politics but it should not be applied to the economy. Um, the way the economy is being run, it seems to be very much determined by uh, powerful players like the government, new liberal state or new liberal governments, and uh, big corporations and the big business. So this is the alternative idea to the myth. And we'll try to... Uh, make a case for this um, uh, throughout the presentation and and through uh, through our discussions hopefully as you can see there there are parallels between this myth and the myth that we had last week uh, last week we had this idea or ideology that economic growth achieved through economic liberalization or globalization alleviates uh, poverty and brings about you know social equality and justice and um, as uh, as you may remember, our argument was that um, uh, the, the, this this myth is problematic because it considered social equality and justice as secondary objectives or goals to growth, and it postpones that to when economic growth is achieved. And um, well, that was justified under the title of trickle down theory. Um, or doctrine, and we discussed and we showed that trickle down has never happened. Uh, quite the opposite, uh, trickle up has happened. And um, uh, and as you can see, both myths or both ideologies are actually trying to uh, consider equality and democracy as something secondary and not primary goal and um, as the byproduct of, of economic growth, uh, which can only be achieved by the adoption of capitalist relations or in extreme uh, or the extreme version of capitalism, i.e. Uh, neoliberalism. And so the, their argument is that if you give um, democracy and equality an importance, um, you know, uh, or consider them as primary goal, you would uh, you would never ever achieve them be- unless you first go for economic growth uh, through capitalism. So this is what we found that trickle down, as we showed through some of the facts and figures, and uh, has never happened, and um, and it quite opposite to that. Trick- what what we saw that we saw that the the, the bottom twenty percent um, um, of the population has. Um, lost their income and wealth, uh, whereas the upper layers, um, the top, especially top one percent or top twenty percent, there um, over the last few decades, they they actually have accumulated more wealth and achieved higher levels of income. Um, so the gaps um, have been growing as the result of the um, adoption of this ideology, uh, neoliberalism. And then we also uh, saw that I, the IMF um, report uh, published in 2016 finally acknowledged that some degree of equality is essential and we cannot consider that as a secondary goal to economic growth. 
And they recommended that we need some kind of state intervention in order to secure some level of equality to, in order to achieve uh, sustainable growth. And we said, well, that's a good acknowledgement. Thank you. But it still, it's not adequate because you're still giving primacy to um, growth. The reason that you are now valuing equality is that because you are worried about economic growth um, and um, this is still problematic. Okay, well, when you look at their recommendation that we need some kind of a state intervention, then uh, you may ask yourself, what, what kind of a state intervention we need? Uh, how should the state intervene and what kind of regulations we should uh, put um, in place in order to achieve some level of equality so the capitalist system would not devolve into a caste system. Well, the necessity of um, intervention or a state-led uh, regulations is not something that um, hidden from anyone. It's, it's that necessity is, is even very obvious to uh, many people who are pro free uh, market um, or the advocates of neoliberalism, especially today. And this is a quote from this book, The Pol Political Governance of Capitalism, A Reassessment Beyond Global Crisis. And it says capitalism is based mainly on self-organization and self-governance of the markets. However, at the same time, global uh, capitalism has become a systemic risk global financial crisis should be regarded as a normal accident and self-destructive tendency of capitalist mar markets normally requires some level of regulation. So this is something that now even uh, the advocates of, um, of new liberalism acknowledge. Well, it's not too difficult to understand why this is the case because, you know, free market and or capitalist markets are based on competition and based on the assumption that every player in the market uh, would understand their um, own self, their self interest, and they would follow their own self interest freely. Well, if you go for such an ideology, and if you try to imagine that you know a capitalist system in its full capacity is in place, then you can um, easily understand that such a situation would be very chaotic when everybody is just seeking their own self-interest. Well, in that case, it would be very extremely difficult to predict what is going to happen. I mean, as, um, as someone who is uh, running a firm or a company, you need to know uh, in what area, on, on what products you should invest and what kind of products you should produce and you need to know a little bit, you know, ahead of your time and um, think ahead of your time so you can plan. Um, otherwise, whatever you invest in can be just simply uh, wasted. So where this certainty is going to come, if the state is kept um, aside and it's kept apart from the market, such a market, such a free market, well, um, it's very easy again to imagine that the big players, the heavy players, the, the, the stronger ones, the ones that have already won the race, will inject certainty by creating monopoly in the market. And therefore, this market, this, the so-called free market in its pure form would, or in its extreme form, would collapse gradually into a system which is completely dominated by monopolies, as, as it has actually happened in, in most cases. So even market fundamentalists don't doubt that market require institutions, some kind of order, you know, a political framework and a cultural pattern in order to function as markets. So it's in favor of capitalism to have the state regulating things so uh, monopolies wouldn't go too big and therefore some level of competitiveness would be always preserved. So this is uh, something that even uh, I think any 
rational capitalists would, uh, would acknowledge. So uh, what are the models then? In what ways we can bring order to the market and achieve some level of equality in order to uh, maintain sustainable growth? Uh, well, there are some models in front of us. You know, the, the Chinese model could be one option, as I explained last week. And uh, we know that the, the Chinese model has been quite successful relative to other models because it mixes market-friendly measures or approaches with um, some kind of a state-led macroeconomic policies. They don't go fully down the drain of new liberalism. They do it very incrementally. And the state keeps um, its control over some key areas, for instance, banking, education, in investments, and so on and so forth. So the state still plays a, a significant role. But as, as we know, the Chinese model also has a, a dark side into it. You know, it's a very authoritarian regime, and we don't see democracy growing there, um, the ecological disasters, including the recent pandemic that has started from there, the corruption, political corruption, violation of human rights and civil rights and lack of transparency and all sorts of things are there. And, and is, the system is very much advanced and it's a kind of a, a state-led um, surveillance capitalism going on. And uh, with China is increasing its access to high tech, this is also actually strengthening the situation, the surveillance state capitalism in, in, in that country. So are we going to choose that model? Uh, well, this seems to be um, a kind of an inspiring example for many of these populist governments. Um, it seems to be they, they are actually, despite the fact that, for instance, Trump launches trade wars with China, but it, he seems to be following the same model mixing new liberalism, keeping some of the major elements of new liberalism as, and mixing it up with um, authoritarianism and uh, with, uh, with a kind of a nationalistic, xenophobic, ethnocentrist um, rhetoric. So it seems that everybody has recognized now that the so-called win-win game is no longer the case. And what was that win-win game? I mean, the game, the win-win game was that, okay, uh, we can, and that was the new liberal, uh, new liberals were arguing for this. They were saying that we can actually offshore dirty manufacturing jobs to, to third world societies. Um, and then these third world societies who would otherwise be totally jobless and backward, they will benefit from offshoring of manufacturing jobs. And um, they can actually make money. The, the labor is cheap there. The resources are cheap there. There are no a strong ecological or um, labor standards in place. And therefore, uh, they produce some uh, products that are very cheap. We can import them here and use them and we can afford buying them because they are very cheap. And um, at the same time, in, in inside the advanced societies, we will upgrade the economy to um, high tech, you know, using high tech. We'll create information economy. We create, you know, knowledge-based economy. And we don't need to be worried about, you know, the manufacturing jobs anymore. And you can see the demise of the manufacturing sector in many of the advanced societies. In, especially in this country as well. Um, I remember I was um, uh, looking for um, socks that are made with um, the Australian wool, um, made in Australia as a gift for a friend in Finland. I was going to travel to Finland. And I just searched and searched them everywhere. I couldn't find anything made in Australia. And someone said, you know, there is something that is made in China with the Australian wool. So it's... Um, so as you can see, we got rid of um, our manufacturing sectors in advanced societies, arguing that, you know, we don't have any advantage in there. We should invest only 
in areas that we have some kind of rel relative advantage. And what's the relative advantage of Australia? It's the, is in mining sector, not in making uh, things. So it's um, now we we see this this idea hasn't worked very well the way that we thought it would be a win win for us and for the third world societies inside the third world societies we'll see child labor happening we'll see women are being exploited to death we'll see uh, workers are exploited we'll see ecological damages are happening and um, and inside the advanced societies we see the rise of gig economy. Yeah, many of our young, educated people are jobless. Those who used to uh, be employed in uh, manufacturing sectors, they are now jobless, and they are actually the ones that, as the result of their disappointment and concerns and anxieties, they go and vote for populist governments like Trump. They, the, the white middle-class men, well, they, they have lost their status as the result of this. So for the majorities of people in the so-called advanced societies or the global north, and also for the majority of the people in the global south, this has been a lose-lose game. And uh, only for a minority of the rich people, the upper class, in both sides of this story, this has been a win-win game. For the majority, it hasn't. And you can see that um, actually in this COVID-19 crisis, uh, why people are panicking and do panic buying. Um, but they're very much afraid, maybe to some extent they're, they're rightful because the the supply chain uh, is interrupted because we have um, weakened our manufacturing sector. Um, a, a, a society as advanced as the United States in, is incapable of, of producing you know, surgical masks. Uh, many of their uh, medical stuff is uh, brought from overseas, from China. And um, they have become very much dependent on the cheap products that are now um, uh, seems to be interrupted significantly by this uh, pandemic. Well, to some extent, this is the case um, and it causes, it justifies the panic. I don't know, but it seems to me that um, this actually, this issue, the interruption of the supply chain uh, is very much related to this so-called uh, win-win game that we ran for a few, deca few decades uh, with the global south. Okay, so, uh, but uh, what um, other options we have if the Chinese model is not a very ideal one? Well, you may um, say, how about the, the nice Scandinavian or social democratic models? Well, actually, we know that what is um, considered as the Scandinavian or social democracy this was actually um, started after the Great Depression in the United States. And they adopted this welfare state model or social democracy or Keynesianism, which was based on the idea that we should save capitalism from itself by uh, giving some welfare to the working class and turn them into middle class because the working, working class is also the consumers at the same time. And this way we can increase the demand for what we produce and therefore uh, this would uh, result in uh, sustainable growth. But then they um, abandoned that. Uh, and they gave up that model in the uh, United States and in the UK in the 1980s. The Scandinavian countries continued using that model, applying that model until they were also joined to the Eurozone and as the result of the policies the European Union adopted, um, centralization and new liberalization, these Scandinavian economies found themselves under a lot of pressure in order to give up. And we'll see they did to some extent and their, their, their approach has also been weakened and uh, and um, inequality in such societies has been increasing. And together with that popu population's disappointment and together with that, we'll see the right-wing parties 
who would never ever imagine any chance to have any chance to grow in such countries have been growing um, recently. And, and another thing is that if it's very much um, uh, inadequate if just one country or a handful of countries adopt social democracy and you know, uh, apply some progressive taxation on their super rich or, or the big business, uh, because the big business would say, okay, um, if, you're, if you're not lowering down your taxes, um, uh, we will move. We will move to other countries that are uh, welcoming us. So social democracy works when there is an international collaboration and an international or global democratic governance that every country agrees to actually not uh, to, to adopt the same policy, to, to uh, not to allow capitalism um, enjoy um, free ride. So it's, um, it's something that needs to be done uh, internationally. And we do not see a strong democratic global governance happening. Just look at the mess that we are in, in terms of COVID-19. We really lack a kind of global governance. Every country is for themselves. And there are even sometimes suspicious of each other. I mean, I just saw in the news that the, uh, when the Doctors Without Borders um, went to Iran, uh, the Iranians uh, said, We're, we can't trust you, and they returned them. And they said that we don't, they rejected the, the help from the organization. So as you can see, there is no um, global governance. When it comes to push for new liberalism, adoption of um, capitalist relations and policies, uh, we'll see powerful states behind that. We'll see international organizations like the IMF and World Bank behind that. But when it comes to global health, um, when it comes to the welfare or well-being of the populations, we don't see that global governance happening. So what, what, what other options? Is that only Ch the Chinese versus the Scandinavian or there are other alternatives? I think there are more, uh, many more, but uh, before I introduce them and we will deal with them later in week eight, uh, we'll see that, you know, this issue of the state, the necessity of the state um, intervention uh, raises the question of power. Uh, so how would we define power? I would just in very, very simple, super simple terms, I would say power is to have control over social relationships. And what is politics is how to use power. And our definition of liberal democracy is that using power by the people's representatives for the interests of their constituencies. So these are things that we need to consider because there seems to be power and politics and democracy playing a strong roles in, in helping us to bring order to chaotic uh, markets. So even Economist, which is a conservative or neoliberal uh, magazine, had this um, saying that says, um, government of the people, by the people, and for the people uh, was Abraham Lincoln's famous mantra. But which people do governments respond to the concerns of the average voter or, or do they merely cater to a privileged elite? So this, you know, what do we really mean by by the people, you know, uh, for the people. Who are these people? And um, it's, again, it's the question of power and in whose interest and who has control over the uh, process of economic growth or um, promotion of equality and justice. All these processes, we need to know who has the control over them and in whose interest um, are such things. So, if that's the case, I mean, it's, it's interesting to know how the myth is justified. You know, what we are told that we should not be worried. I mean, if, um, if we really adopt pure capitalism, it, uh, democracy will be finally delivered. You know, it's again, democracy will be trickled down. Uh, so how would they justify this? I mean, they say more economic liberalization, 
would result in more prosperity and more wealth, and this would result in the rise of the middle class. And when the middle class um, have satisfied their basic needs, I don't know if you have come across with um, uh, Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs is a theory. And he says, you know, um, needs are, he puts them in a, in a hierarchical order and he says that first the basic needs need to be satisfied, you know, for the food, for the shelter, um, security and things like that. And then when the basic needs are satisfied, then people will start thinking about um, needs of higher order, for instance, in the need for education, the need for freedom of press or freedom of faith that or human rights and things like that. Well, they, they use that kind of mentality and then they say, okay, when the basic needs are satisfied uh, by the middle class, rising middle class, then the middle class would um, crave for new values and demand for property rights, civil rights, human rights and individualism. And this would actually results in democracy being flourished and the middle class would put pressure on the uh, regimes, you know, dictatorial regimes and also authoritarian regimes. And as the result of such pressures, then uh, we'll see they give up and they will, they will adopt democracy. It's, it's actually uh, very easy to argue against this because, you know, we, as you can just think of the case of China again, <laughs> Um, or many of the other third world societies since they have adopted neoliberalism. When we don't see the middle class, the rising middle class, for instance, in the case of China, would put pressures on the regime. As soon as they, um, they, um, they accumulate some wealth, they send their kids overseas and then they go themselves overseas and um, they're more interested in leaving the country or, or just enjoying their wealth. Um, and um, they're, they're not interested in democracy um, as far as we can see. And this seems to be coming from a very bad, really, really bad mistake um, in terms of what happened in the West. They say that as, you know, in the West, um, we had first the rise of the middle class. And as the result of that, we had more democracy. That's completely wrong. That's actually the opposite. If you look at the history of democracy in the West, in the so-called advanced societies, in Europe, in America, UK, here, actually democracy was um, the result of movements, the labor movements, especially women played a strong role. And they, um, as a result of rising labor movements in early 20th century, and then these movements put pressure on on, on the state, um, on the governments of the time, and then they achieved the, the right to vote and the right to form unions, to the right to form associations and defend the rights to defend their collective rights. And as a result of achieving such rights, then they could actually influence legislations in favor of their own welfare, the working class welfare. And as the result of that, then we had the rise of the middle class, which, which, were, which used to be the working class, the lower um, working class. So it's the working class which actually became the middle class as the result of democracy and uh, not the other way around. And, uh, and if you consider this, therefore, any expectation that the achievement of wealth and prosperity would result in increase in the demand for human rights or democratic rights or democratic values. That doesn't seem to make sense. Another argument is that, you know, by adopting neoliberalism, we get rid of big government and then this, um, this creates some um, uh, greater space uh, for the uh, non-government actors like, you know, uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, entrepreneurs, and things like that. And, and so non-government actors, corporations, they will uh, have greater space. And then oh, as the result of um, the smaller government, we will have more democracy. 
Again, this is a very problematic um, assumption because uh, we know that, well, the argument that the government, if we give too much economic power to the government, to the state, and if we concentrate um, uh, economic power in the hands of the state, the state gets corrupt, and um, as the result of that, democracy would fade. But that, uh, the neoliberal solution to that is not to de-corrupt the state. Their solution is that to take the economic power and control from the government and giving it to the private sector. And by the private sector, of course, they don't mean the small business. They mean big corporations, practically. So how come we cannot de-corrupt a corrupt government um, through democratic means that we have, but we can de-corrupt corporations who are not elected at all? And if you just look at them, how they are internally run, you see that corporations are run or managed very top down. And they, they're not, um, the decisions in such corporations, big corporations, are not democratically made. So they are not elected bodies, um, none of these corporations, and uh, not run democratically. So how come transferring economic power from the hands of government to the hands of corporation can give us more democracy? That's a, um, that, that's a one million dollar question we should raise. And then other, there are other justifications, for instance, new information and communication technologies would flourish and we will have freedom of information. And we, we, we have seen how, for instance, this um, social media has been used and abused. And we see the influence of, again, big corporations are trying to, to occupy um, the virtual uh, or the cyberspace and um, and these are things that we have also witnessed. So again, this kind of um, argument um, has its own problems. So again, all of these justifications are telling us that um, the state intervention is, if it is required, it should not contradict the laws of free market because there is no alternative. How come? I mean, again, another justification is that, you know, um, well, Free market is democratic naturally, and you ask why? Why you think it's um, it's democratic? You know, their argument is that you know consumers in a free market are you know vote for the winners and losers with their purchases. So if there is a product that people don't like, they don't buy, and therefore uh, this is like you know penalizing the producer. Uh, it's like voting against the producer, but n- by not buying the product. Or if um, um, if the product turns out to be a very popular one, uh, or the services becomes a popular one, well, people uh, buy that, buy more of that, and therefore they are voting in favor of that service or the product or whatever. Well, again, this is as you can see, it's kind of problematic. It assumes that all the consumers have perfect knowledge of their own interest and what product is in their own interest or what product is the best. And they're not being influenced by the <laughs> the advertisement industry, which is multi-billion dollar industry. And, um, and you know, they refer to, to theories like public choice theory by James Buchanan. Um, who argues that individuals make their decisions rationally based on their own self-interest and therefore there is no need for government to decide on their behalf. And um, and they think that, you know, I mean, just think of this COVID-19 again and the way how people react. And on the one hand, you had this panic buying. On the other hand, you had these people crowding the beaches as if nothing is happening. And um, um, and we we didn't see any guidance. We didn't see any leadership. We didn't see any um, any rational and um, um, and useful governance um, happening. And well, in the, again, this this challenges this ideology. And then they say, okay, if you know markets uh, behave very democratically, uh, I mean. 
And then this, if we, we apply the same principles the markets um, are um, following in the politics, then we'll have actually um, a democratic uh, political system where the losers and winners will be chosen by, by people's uh, uh, votes. But again, we see that the influence of the money into the politics and, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, this kind of um, ideology leads to the reduction of politics to economy. Politics must be modeled, the politics must be modeled based on the free market. Political parties are the suppliers. Now, if you just think of politics as a market, political parties are the suppliers of solutions and policy changes or policy agendas. And the citizens are their consumers. And when they, are, for any reason, the demand for a specific way of running the system increases, the party that um, can satisfy that demand will be the winner, right? Like in the free markets where monopolies grow, we know that, you know, major political parties completely dominate the, the, um, the environment, the political environment. And you've got two major parties behaving like, you know, KFC versus McDonald's. And you don't see uh, really significant differences between them, but rhetorically, they, they try to exaggerate their differences as if they're very, very big differences. But you see for decades or maybe for a century or so, these two political parties have been the, the dominant forces in, in the politics in the West. You go to the United States, two major parties. You go to the UK, two major parties. You come to Australia, two major parties. And um, I would like to refer you to, uh, to this report, the Index of Systemic Trends by the Next um, System uh, Organization. And um, they, this report is very interesting because it tells you uh, by referring to a number of indicators like poverty, wages, and inequality, and corruption, they actually make a case um, that it, it, it actually, whether this major party or that major, major party is in power, none of these indicators have changed significantly. And this shows that the problems that we have are so systemic that by, you know, changing the government from one party, major party, to another major party has never ever solved any of such issues because they seem to be, these issues seem to be very structural, very systemic. And this, you know, they say one of the signs that a crisis is systemic rather than purely political or economic is that key indicators decline or stay the same regardless of changes in political power or business cycles. <clears throat> Getting back to this, you know, I mean, is there any alternative, real alternative? I mean, I think that um, an alternative way of, we have to first look at the problem uh, differently. And this is my argument that democracy cannot be delivered by a system that undermines it undermines democracy in it in the first place since the winners in this system in in a free market economy uh, can always use their power and resources to influence the state and the politics and of course the, the public opinion and determine the results of elections economic power is as strong as political power if not less potent and what we are seeing is just one dollar one vote practically you know, the more dollars you have, the more, the stronger your vote will be. And I would like to, again, refer you to this uh, issue of Citizens United in the United States. Go and Google it or, or go to the YouTube and search for that. It's very interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a um, legislation they passed a few years ago uh, that allows the big corporations to make big donations to political parties. And this really compromises the democracy and turns it into plutocracy, which means the rule of the super rich. So in an excessively competitive economy, markets tend to become chaotic due to lack of structure, almost impossible to plan. Big business uses its power to inject certainty to the system by creating monopolies. 
and gaining control over other actors. And that's what I explained before. To avoid this, the economic realm must also be democratized because the political and the economic are highly intertwined in reality. Um, so as you can see in reality, the politics and, and economy cannot be really separated. We cannot say democracy only belongs to politics and the economy should be run top-down autocratic um, and dominated by monopolies. So I can refer you to many, many examples that, you know, these giant corporations are even there to challenge it. The, the governments who, who, who legislated in favor of their population's health, for instance, tobacco giant, giant Philip Morris sued Australia for introducing plain packet cigarettes and so on and so forth. You can, you can find many of such examples that shows how powerful corporations have become. But you know, when we find the solutions, the alternatives, we can look back and see try to reinvent the old responses, like, as I said before, social democracy, Scandinavian models, using progressive taxations or basic income for everyone, or use socialism, or re- again, try to reinvent socialism in a more democratic way. Um, or, again, we, uh, other options could be left-wing versus right-wing populism. And there is a list of of other alternatives that go beyond reinvention and try to introduce something pretty new. Uh, Looking back to the history and see what went wrong, because that is very important. You know, one of the things that we can do in order to uh, find the solution or alternative is to see, okay, we have tried some alternatives in 20th century. What happened? Why why we couldn't... uh, uh, what went wrong? Why we couldn't promote them to something, uh, to a successful story? And uh, its reflections, historical reflections are very much helpful. And I would uh, like to do that, a little bit of that here in this slide, under the title of A Tale of Two Broken Systems, uh, Communism and, and, and Capitalism. Uh, well, if you look at the history of 20th century, communism emerged as the opposition as the alternative, as the only powerful alternative to capitalism. There were many, many ideas, but none of them actually could gain the momentum communism um, actually could get. And um, as a result of that, well, so we had the Cold War. You know, the, the world was divided between the West and the East, and the East was communist, and the West was capitalism, and they were uh, they were considered um, impossible to 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 bring together. But when you um, take a deeper look, uh, what I'm going to argue here is that actually they, despite the fact they look very opposite, they were mostly mirror image of one another because they shared some something very important, and that was the separation of the politics and the economy and giving primacy to one over the other which I call it dualism. Dualism is that, for instance, men versus women or, or uh, dark well, versus bright um, uh, or, you know, uh, poly- uh, economy versus ecology. Um, so this kind of dualism, you know, you, you separate two things and you give primacy um, to one over the other. And uh, when you look at the communist um, system, in, they, they like, the cap, like the capitalist system, they separated the two realms and they um, made the economy um, subsidiary, which means secondary or subservient to uh, the politics. And politics was completely controlled by one single party, the communist party, and the communist party, party was... Uh, uh, doing central planning. So the economy was completely planned and was completely, almost completely controlled by the politics, by, by the ruling party, the single ruling party. So in such a system, when something goes wrong with the economy and the economy, uh, you know, you, you've got economic crisis or something. Uh, well, because the state is very much dependent on 
on controlling, the state is in charge of controlling the economy. Uh, the collapse of the economy will quickly and easily uh, translate into the collapse of the politics. And that's exactly what we saw. Uh, when the economy declined, the politics declined, and then we had the fall of the Soviet Union, which is all, all, almost over a night, in a very, very short period of time, very quickly. So that's why some people prefer to call communism with another name, use another name, and that's state capitalism. Because what w- was happening in practice, it was not socialism because uh, the workers had no rights. The workers uh, didn't control what to produce, how to produce, and how to um, divide or share the, um, the, the output or the profit. Um, they were very much um, subjugated to the system and uh, not none of the decisions were made by the workers directly and no democratic decision making was in place and therefore uh, the system was very different to what it was called it was not a socialist system it was uh, from this point of view the concentration of capital or economy in the hands of the state or um, um, or another word for that would be state capitalism so they argued that they were arguing that um, on the surface they were arguing that socialism is good for the people, but practically what was happening was the capitalism for the uh, ruling party. But uh, how about capitalism? In a capitalist society, again we see the separation of the politics uh, from the economy, democracy or liberal democracy or li- only uh, limited to the politics. And uh, but it's the opposite. It's as I said, it's a mirror image. Uh, the 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 economy is the sector that dominates the politics or the state. I mean, by the economy, of course, I mean the big business. And um, and therefore, the state, when things go wrong, unlike the communist regimes, uh, it's the state that. Um, that is blamed for because a state is, um, is, is under the control of the economy. A state is responsible through the democratic measures, uh, is responsible for what goes wrong. And as the result of that, the state's um, primary job is to save the economy. And by that, they mean to save the big corporations because as Obama said, They are too big to fail. So we have to save them. Saving the economy means saving the corporations, big corporations. And saving the big corporations or the corporate sector means saving the economy. Therefore, the state intervenes and comes and rescues and has injects a lot of money uh, to these corporations. And we see that now happening. Half a trillion dollars is promised by uh, Trump to big corporations to save them. Uh, to bail them out of this COVID-19 pandemic crisis. And uh, we'll see that um, uh, the, the, as, uh, as Martin Luther King a um, few decades ago said, I mean, in the capitalist system, actually um, it's socialism for the rich because when they have any, um, um, any issues, it's the state in, you know, giving them handouts and big, big handouts. In practice, you know, capitalism is socialism for the rich. And um, so uh, you can see these systems have their big faults and they're very uh, problematic because both systems are, are, are separating the politics from the economy and both systems give dominance to, to one side, to another one. But the issue with the capitalism is that capitalism can survive because always it's the state or the government that, I mean, partly rightfully gets blamed for what goes wrong. And um, and the state has to uh, come and save the capitalist system by uh, going for huge debts. And who pays the debt? Of course, the taxpayers, generations after generations have to pay these debts. Um, and um, by... Uh, cutting the budgets and uh, adopting austerity measures and uh, 
um, and cutting the socialist spendings and so on and so forth. So it will be more and more pressures on the masses, on the working class to save the economy, to save capitalism. So that's why capitalism does not collapse or hasn't collapsed like the way communism collapsed, and that's because of that difference. Well, this um, uh, takes us to this um, point that, I mean, the politics and economy are very much intertwined. Um, I, I, I later, next, um, in next few weeks, I will discuss two other sectors in society that are also, by and large, ignored. Uh, one is community, or you may call it civil society, and the other one is the ecosystem, the web of life. And they also need to be brought into our equation. But I don't have time for that, and it's not very relevant for today's discussion. So what I'm saying is that, you know, if you if you really want democracy in the uh, political sector, well, democracy here, if you want politics to be more and more democratic, then we need to make sure that the economy is also democratized. Um, and also ecologized, which means made um, um, environmentally friendly and sustainable. I don't get into that. But um, how would we democratize the economy? Well, well, democratize the workplaces. Uh, Most of us spend most of our time in workplaces and uh, we have how much influence we have, how much our views really matter in such places. Almost none. And um, and so by the, by promoting economic democracy through the promotion of uh, worker-owned cooperatives, um, cooperatives that are not only owned by, by the by the workers, by the employees, but also managed and controlled, and you would also have all other um, um, stakeholders like the community involved in managing the economy. Uh, uh, bodies or economic firms or companies, and also consideration of the web of life or the ecology in that. So this, this, if you cannot really achieve political democracy, real democracy, the one that really matters and would make a difference and would be able to address the systemic problems, we cannot do that unless we we also consider the economy as another sector that needs to be democratized. But we know that there have been forces for the, sorry, for the democratization of, um, of the economy. Uh, but they haven't been very much successful. Uh, why is that? It's very difficult uh, in this country to set up a worker-owned cooperative their legislations are not that clear, the policies are not that clear. I know some people have been involved in creating apps that would help people to get their heads around the sophisticated policies of creating cooperatives. Um, And uh, so what would this require? This would require that the politics become much more socialized and I would say equalized, meaning that um, we would just um, replace this... um, you know, um, electoral shows that happen every few years with something really genuine. For instance, consider that the parliaments will be the council of the councils. You know, elections, you know, people um, in local areas and suburbs would uh, de- send their delegates to, um, to the local councils and local councils would send their delegates to, to the state council or a state parliament and so on. So we can build up democracy from bottom up instead of leaving it to the hands of po- political parties that are actually representing their own political ideologies rather than representing the, the real interest of the communities. So as you can see, by bringing community into the equation and giving more power to the community, more political power to the community, we can actually pave the way for the economy to become more democratized. So as you can see, this, any change in any sector is dependent on change in other sectors. And this is because society, you know, this um, 
aspects of life are so intertwined and so um, interdependent. Otherwise, what we will be witnessing will be the demise of democracy into more populism and authoritarianism because uh, political democracy that we have has become dysfunctional as the result of the influence of money um, or capital or capitalism. And, and the economy is also has become dysfunctional because decisions are important economic decisions are not made truly democratically by the people for the people. Um, so, you know, we may get very surprised and, you know, when Trump opens his mouth and says things and we say, well, oh, that's not politically correct. And correct. But, I mean, I just uh, was looking at um, the history and then in some of these um, um, historical facts, you know, you can you can refer to what Churchill said, you know, and that that those days, what Churchill was saying was very quite normal, and and uh, what we say political correctness is something pretty new, and that's why we were very much surprised when Trump says things, but things that Trump says worse than that had already been had already been said in the history. For instance, Churchill, the very famous figure. Um, in the um, British politics, he said, the government of the world must be entrusted to satisfied nations who wish nothing more for themselves than what they have. If the world government were in the hands of hungry nations, there would always be danger. But none of us had any reason to seek for anything more. The peace would be kept by, by peoples who lived in their own way and were not ambitious. Or that means the United States, you know, um, is not ambitious. You know, the UK or the, the, the Western powers are not ambitious. Our power placed us above the rest. We were like rich men dwelling at peace within their habitation. So as you can see, this mentality is finding its way back into our politics we thought that we got rid of this kind of mentality. This is the same person who um, allegedly said, three creatures no need to have homes. They can live with their masters. The dogs, uh, the um, Australian uh, Aborigines, and the Palestinians, they don't need to have homes for themselves. So this, um, uh, this, is, this seems to be finding its way back to our politics. And why? I mean, have you ever asked yourself why why the politics has been so dominated in uh, the so-called democratic societies by two major parties. Well, if you look at the, uh, the, the way the, these business cycles are happening and the economic cycles are happening, there seems to be kind of an interesting correlation between the, the economic cycles and political cycles. Uh, and that, again, indicates how intertwined the politics and the economy are. And uh, uh, let me start from a point where you've got a society where you've got, you know, the, uh, the economy is not doing well. They, there is no economic growth. And then the center right comes up and says it's because we are not looking after the rich. The rich is the engine of the, of, of, of the growth. And we should actually relax our regulations and give them tax breaks and tax shelters and uh, relax our environmental and labor standards in order to give them a bit of a leverage. And, and then they, this may result in some economic growth uh, because then the super rich will be very much um, incentivized to to invest, you know, the corporations will come and invest, and then you see you you see some um, improvements in GDP numbers. And uh, well, then after a while, people realize yes, the economy is doing well. The numbers are all good. Uh, like that happened in two thousand and seven election here when um, Kevin Rudd won, and then uh, the economy was doing well. It's just one year before the GFC global financial crisis happening. Uh, but people realize that uh, despite the fact all numbers are doing well and the, 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 the economy is growing, but not much is there for them because they've lost their job securities, 
there is no union to defend them or the unions are weakened uh, because the labor standards were weakened, the environment is getting damaged and we've got climate change. And then I be, people have become so concerned. And what is, I mean, why the pie is not, the pie is growing, but the pie is growing, but it's not being shared equally. And we're not getting the fair share. And then the center left comes and the center left says, no, we have a lot of wealth and uh, we have to now um, redistribute the wealth. And they win, maybe land a slight you know, victory and they come to power and then they say, OK, and then they give the people a little bit of handouts and um, they may tighten things and they may put some taxations on carbon or on, on, on corporations They may increase the corporate tax a little bit. But then they face um, a lot of resistance, and most of these handouts they give to the people they uh, because people have no control over the economy. They're just reduced to consumers and casual job keepers, you know, casual employees. So they, the, they, they, even these um, handouts will end up in the hands of the corporations because people use them to pay their bills and to to uh, buy things for themselves. So these. Um, uh, finally, people realize that, um, yes, the redistribution of wealth helped them a, li- helped them a, li- a little bit, but then again, um, at the cost of the national budget deficit growing and the, because the, again, the center left is not really strong enough on, or is not very tough enough on this, on the rich. Um, on the corporations, the, 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 the income from the corporate tax is not there. And, um, and therefore they go for bigger and bigger loans and the, the national debt grows and the household debt grows. And then again, center, center right comes back and says, well, the labor is only good at spending, not growing the economy. We have to again, uh, look after the rich and look after the corporations. And make sure that the economy would grow again. And again, people being fed up by the center left uh, because they were not very honest in terms of um, their policies, redistributive policies. They they go and vote for the center right this time. And as you can see with the fluctuations, the business cycles, um, you see these political cycles are happening. But for how long this uh, game can be played? Uh, of course, um, the the capacity of the system to to satisfy people's real needs will become exhausted and exhausted, and you've got the accumulations of the problems and um, the accumulation of the crises one after the other, and people become so disappointed by with both with both sides of the center, and that's why what we say the center can't hold it anymore. And then you've got um, the, 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 the opportunity is now, it's, it, it's great for non-center or, or, or extremist pol- uh, politicians to come up and then say that actually we, ha- we're, we have the solutions, don't vote for the major parties. And then that can be from the extreme left, um, very rarely happens these days. Or it can be from the uh, the extreme right, you know, the neo populists or national ultra nationalistic politicians uh, gain momentum, and um, you know, it's the the, the 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 same people, the the the, the owners of the, the big corporations, the ones that had uh, this kind of problems with their own workers, would just come up and say, well, actually. Don't don't vote for these politicians. They're corrupt and just vote for me. I'm a big businessman. I have a good record, as, as Trump said. I've got a good record in business and I can run the country as a business uh, very much more successful than these corrupt politicians. But these corrupt politicians used to be your uh, puppets. Now, they, people are fed up with the puppets and the, the puppet master comes up and says, you know, vote for me now. Um, so we'll see this is what is practically happening in the absence of movements that would just seek real democracy, you know, uh, a democracy that in, in, in which, you know, the members of, of, the, of the society would determine collectively, equally, and without, without arbitrary imposed constraints, the policies 
that shape their destinies. And if you adopt this kind of definition as a definition of a, a more profound, you know, a more a real democracy, the, the democracy that the population deserve, then you'll see that, you know, we don't see much progress um, uh, across the world. And this is captured by the paradox of democracy on the title of uh, the paradox of democracy that in 1974, as um, Larry Diamond says in his book, The Spirit of Democracy, nearly three quarters of all countries were dictatorships. Today, more than half are democracies. Yet, recent um, efforts to promote democracy have stumbled and, and many democratic governments are faltering. And this seems to be uh, the case. We'll see that, you know, yes, the percentage of electoral democracies has been increasing. Many countries have started to adopt elections because that gives them more credibility and more legitimacy and they can show, you know, people love us. You know, maybe you, uh, you've heard of Saddam Hussein, the dictator in Iraq, prior to the Iraq invasion, had an election and he said that he is um, elected by 100% of his population. So even dictators love elections because they know that they can actually uh, rig them. Uh, they can uh, manipulate uh, uh, the popul- public opinion. They can actually uh, rig the elections. And, and uh, uh, so, again, you know, report after the report shows that more and more countries have adopted electoral democracies or elections. But when you look deeper into um, the quality of, of the democratic uh, si- systems, so the so-called democratic systems, you see a decline, uh, not only in the third world societies or the poor societies, but also uh, in the advanced societies. And um, the same reports would, um, uh, you, know, you know, tell us, you know, this is, this is, for instance, what they published in 2018 that's, uh, from the Freedom House that measures um, freedom and democracy across the world. And it's kind of a conservative, liberal um, um, institution, institution and says democracy faced its most serious crisis in decades in 2017 as its basic tenets, uh, including uh, guarantees of free and fair elections, the rights of minorities, freedom of the press, and the rule of law came under attack around the world. 71 countries suffered net declines in political rights and civil liberties, with only 35 registering gains. This marked the 12th consecutive year of decline in global freedom. And this is not uh, what, you know, radical leftists would tell us. This is something that a a kind of um, liberal conservative um, institute is telling us. And all those arguments, you know, about, you know, how capitalist globalization promotes democracy. This this, um, article, journal article, Economic Globalization and Democracy, is a very good one. It's old, but it's a very good one in terms of, you know, because it it actually brings all the arguments, positive, negative, and neutral together and compares them. I I summarize them through these graphs and, and tables. Uh, to YouTube and search for coronavirus capitalism. There is a good number of things, you know, that are being added um, coming up, um, especially this one by um, uh, Naomi Klein. Um, she is one of the uh, perhaps a very influential figure in the uh, um, democratic movement, global the global justice movement. Um, her books, some... Um, are very well read by many activists. More recently, uh, was it On Fire or something? Yes. Um, and The Shock Doctrine. And she argues that in the time of crisis, the capitalist state and capitalists try to push for, use that opportunity to push for their agendas. And, uh, and uh, I mean, but also sometimes you hear good stories. i I don't think I can find it here, but for instance, in Spain, because um, I heard or I saw somewhere, they actually nationalized the the health in response to the pandemic. And that's very, uh, that's understandable because 
You know, um, for decades we were told that the public health is dysfunctional, we should privatize, privatize, privatize. And now in the time of this huge pandemic, I don't know if you agree with me or not, but we don't see, we don't hear much from the private sector, you know, or private insurance uh, companies. And where are they? I mean, why, why how they can help, help us out of this? And um, you don't really... Um, hear that in or you don't see that in the news or in the debates uh, and again the job of dealing with this pandemic in the crisis is just given to the public um, health or public sector and um, and the public sector is have been underfunded for decades and um, you'll see these um, differences across the countries that the more underfunded their public health the more in in mess they are in mess they are, 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 in mess 